Utah is now facing its most dire episode yet in this epidemic, and frankly, it doesn't matter how tired we are. We must, in fact, win this fight. Our infections are at an all-time high. As a state government, we owe it to you to make critical decisions about the COVID-19 pandemic based on critical health data, not based on fear and certainly not based on politics. A Utah group has been organizing what they call flash mobs. They show up to grocery stores without a face mask, arriving at stores that require a mask to actually come in. Kelly Bond joins us live with more of the group called Defending Utah and these demonstrations, Kelly. That's right. So some of these flash mobs have happened at Harmon's grocery stores and Defending Utah says they have plenty more of these planned for the future. Now, how it works is supporters who agree with their anti-mask message, they sign up on a phone list and then the day of the demonstration, they'll get a text saying where to meet. Last week at Winco, you're not going to believe what happened. This is video from Defending Utah's YouTube channel showing one of their demonstrations where the group entered the store without masks. In a world of masks. Who is left to defend your rights? A spokesperson for Defending Utah, Scott Bradley, wouldn't go on camera, but says the group sees mask requirements as an encroachment of their freedoms. But they're going to do it again, and again and again, every single Thursday. Now you don't have to shop in fear. All right, hit it. Woo! Girls mask. <laughs> is sick and tired of having to wear one of these things every time you go to the store. All of us are. Who is tired of having to wear a muzzle? We are. I am. A passionate call for action Friday morning in St. George. Several police officers on standby as many locals called concerns about coronavirus spikes overblown. The flu kills more than coronavirus. Others calling the virus a hoax or stating that asymptomatic carriers simply do not exist and they cannot be forced to wear masks anywhere as citizens of the United States. If we want to wear a mask, that's fine. We can take care of ourselves. Some rally attendees say they shouldn't ever wear masks if they have any medical issues or mental health concerns or if they they feel they simply can't breathe. When George Floyd was saying, I can't breathe, and then he died, and now we're wearing a mask, and we say, I can't breathe, but we're being forced to wear it anyway. But many say that they believe in all cases, masks jeopardize kids' health. Parents are demanding they have the right to decide what to do with their children. I'll tell you another reason I hate masks. Most child molesters love them. I was born and raised in this country, and it's, I'm very sad to see the authorities stomping on our constitutional rights. God formed man out of the earth and breathed his breath in him and he became a living soul. Where do you derive the authority to regulate human breathing? We the people will work day and night to clean every single seat if need be. We will get together and do a citizen's arrest on every single human being that goes against the freedom of choice, okay? Hey, good morning. Uh, let me ask you all, do you believe you're God? Do you believe you can override God's divine plan for our lives? Do you believe God gave us life and God can take away our lives? Well, if you answer yes to all these questions, who gives you the right to choose how we live our lives? I choose faith over fear every day. You're not God, and since masks are harmful, where there is risk, there should be choice. You're removing our freedoms and stomping on our con constitutional rights by these communist dictatorship orders or laws you want to mandate. It's probably not terribly surprising uh, to see public health issues become politicized. You know, we can look back over a hundred years 
and not even about infectious diseases, but you know about about seat belts, about bike helmets, about fluoridation of water. The list goes on and on and on. We see kind of the politicizing of these public health interventions, and I think it very much relates to the uh, the support that people feel for the president of the United States. Who has very much made this a political issue, and he made it a political issue by suggesting in the beginning of this crisis in regard to the pandemic that this might be a hoax, that this might be a trick or a conspiracy in order to uh, defy him and also to prevent his reelection. So when we think about what arguments are being made, you know, against uh, wearing masks, most of the arguments that we see are really couched in language around personal freedom, about it being your choice. A lot of this opposition is focused on kind of the politics of the disease itself. What they're using in regard to their opposition is the language of rights. It is my right not to wear a mask. The Constitution of the United States, particularly the Bill of Rights, talks about the freedom of speech, press, assembly, trial, and gun ownership, among other things. I don't hear the word mask in any of that. And what I also understand about this is that we all realize that these rights are not absolute, that you have to balance individual liberty with community responsibility and community need. We don't realize that we repeatedly are allowed to sacrifice and willingly self-sacrifice our rights for the greater good. We don't smoke anywhere we want. We wear seat belts, but no one is objecting to those issues. Don't you know that ain't cool? When you look at kind of other prior public health interventions, there's consistently that opposition in the early stage. So in the 1980s, uh, you know, when other, when more states were mandating seatbelts, policymakers would report kind of being called Nazis uh, or like other really kind of ugly language around this idea of forcing people to do something that they viewed as Civil their freedom. Council says, if you don't have seatbelts, get them. If you do have seatbelts, use them. Seatbelts can and do save lives every day. You're not allowed to drive drunk, okay? You're not allowed to text when you drive. There are so many things that we say, yeah, those are acceptable. So the only reason in my mind this becomes unacceptable is when you start to tie it into political identity and into the president's reelection. Today, a group of California Trump supporters rallied in Sacramento to stop the steal, in their words, echoing the president's claims of voter fraud. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. I'm here to support my president. I'm here to support the Constitution. I'm here to support every American's right to vote. The country is very, very divided. And I think Trump um, is a unifier. And so after terrorist attack in 9-11, you have kind of anthrax being sent to government officials, uh, to, to news agencies. And so what emerged from the anthrax attacks and the confusion was you, you have the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, they released the Crisis and Emergency Risk Communication, or it's CERC you know, kind of outlining the basic steps of kind of how you might or how the government should respond to disasters. And so for 20 years, almost, you know, that's that's what the U.S. federal government did. Great. All carried the date 9-11-01 at the top. You see political leaders speaking about the disease, about the response. You have kind of a shunting of career scientists within the, within the federal government. In 1958, the Gallup organization, a polling organization, began to ask the question of the American people, do you trust the government to do what is right all or most of the time? And in 1958, 75% of Americans said, we trust the government to do what is right all or most of the time. 
And then what we've seen is a massive erosion of those numbers. So that 75% number by the mid 90s had dropped to 25% of the American people. The number now is approximately half of that, about 12 to 13% of Americans trust the government. Remember, the president is the only person we all elect. So the president has always been a role model. He's always been a standard bearer. He has been basically the father of the country. People see themselves very much in the president and in the president's policies. I think there is an intensity about this today, which you can perhaps see to some degree uh, in Barack Obama's presidency, but we've seen in the 21st century an intensification of this divisiveness and diversity being uh, focused on an individual. I've seen, if you will, a hunkering down of people, a hunkering down in their slots, in their identities, where they don't understand or don't care to understand people beyond their bubbles. And in not understanding people beyond their bubbles, you have this problem of a, a fragmentation, a factionalization of the society. I, I have a difficult time envisioning scenarios by which there's going to be more overlap between uh, political parties. And so when the next kind of infectious disease happens, and let's say a Democrat is in the, in the White House, then Republicans are going to look back to 2020 and say, hey, we can do the same thing uh, to try and politicize kind of the disease response that they had, uh, that, that Democrats did to, did to Trump, right? And so it's gonna become this kind of like way in which kind of partisans are going to try and one-up each other. When needed, I wear a mask. Okay, let me ask. I don't have, to, I don't wear a mask like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking 200 feet away from it. He shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. I'm an educator and I, my premise of my whole life, my whole career has been, you can, people can be ignorant, people can be uneducated, but they can also understand evidence. They can understand logic. And what I find absolutely disconcerting is these people's inability to accept evidence that disagrees with their position. And I get to the point where I meet somebody like this and I, the first thing I say to them is, all right, you believe in this, I believe in this. What do I have to tell you that you would find convincing that you would change your opinion? And I so often get the response, there is nothing you can tell me, nothing you can tell me that would get me to change my opinion. At that point I say, well, let's just enjoy the event because this conversation is at an end. It's very, very hard to talk to people who refuse to accept any opinion other than their own. And the key is to mobilize those people who agree with you, those people who seem to have a similar idea about how this society needs to run and what's most important about this. Good evening, fellow Utahns. As you know, we're in the midst of a serious pandemic. The number of infections in our state is growing at an alarming rate. Our hospitals in Utah are among the best in the world, but they cannot give the best care when hospitals are at capacity and medical professionals are exhausted and spread too thin. And that is what is happening now. In our war against COVID-19, I mean, we need stroke, our doctors and our nurses. Some hospitals the state have is considering setting up a field hospital like they did in the spring. But doctors the say high. there may not be enough Miser medical risk. personnel to staff it. Cases surge, nurses and doctors and we already working overtime shifts day after day. pressure. We don't our hospitals are full like they did in the spring. But doctors say there may not be enough medical personnel to staff Thank you.